uh, it's an honor to be with you all today. Uh, I'll be virtually. Uh, I want to thank uh, Justin, Henry, and the entire faith-driven investor community for giving me the opportunity uh, to speak with you today. Uh, in my talk, I would love to just share three things with you. Uh, the first is a little bit of my story, which includes how I failed at helping uh, people living in poverty. The second uh, is to describe what I've learned about the process by which poor countries actually become prosperous. And the third is to provide some ideas on how and why you uh, should take part in that process. Um, but first, here's my story, um, and really more accurately, uh, my, my failure. Um, so, originally I'm from Nigeria. Um, I was fortunate at the age of 16 to get a scholarship to come to the U.S. for college. Uh, and when I came here, I bought a one-way ticket. I felt like I had won the lottery. No intentions of ever going, going back. And when you're from a poor country, there are very few paths to actually uh, creating prosperity for yourself and your family. And so I, I, I really took advantage of being in America. Now, after studying, I got a job as an engineer and I was working and, and living the American dream. Embraced it. I bought a house, bought a car, even bought an SUV. Uh, and I was well on my way uh, to achieving the American dream. And then one night in February 2008, eight years after I'd been here, I read about a 10-year-old girl who had to wake up every morning uh, in Ethiopia, uh, every morning at 3 a.m., and she had to walk miles, fetch firewood, and essentially uh, sell so she could take care of her family. Uh, she just wanted to go to school. Now, reading about her changed the trajectory of my life. Um, it did that because I realized that there were hundreds of millions of other uh, young children like her um, who suffered a similar fate. And it was that night I decided that I want to dedicate my life uh, to figuring out how to make help people become prosperous. Now, I was a Christ follower at the time, and somehow I just could not reconcile my faith and my lifestyle with what I was learning about poverty. And so I just had to do something uh, something about it. So with the help of some friends, um, I started a nonprofit organization called Poverty Stops Here. Now, we were committed to uh, ending poverty in the world. Uh, we were ambitious, uh, we were excited, and we were fortunate to even raise a few hundred thousand dollars. Uh, we focused on building wells to provide water in poor communities, providing funds for education, and uh, giving out some microloans. But after building a few wells, something interesting began to happen. Uh, we realized that many of the wells we built would just break. And, you know, I couldn't in good conscience continue to raise money and go out uh, to communities, build wells and have them uh, break. Our programs were not sustainable. And when you think about it, simply put, our strategy, right, our underlying strategy of providing resources to poor communities in the hopes that these resources would solve their problem of poverty was failing. That was my first introduction to major failure. Well, it turns out that strategy dominates most activities in the anti-poverty world today. You know, it's no surprise uh, we've spent uh, trillions of dollars over the past several decades trying to help poor countries prosper, um, but billions of people today are still living a desperately poor lives. See, I've learned that what people really want is prosperity, it's security, it's hope, uh, it's a future where they can imagine their lives and the lives of their children getting better. Simply put, when we look at improving poverty metrics, um, it's like treating the symptoms of a disease without focusing on the root cause. And so the question right, then becomes, how do we create a sustainable path to prosperity? Now this leads me to my second point. You know, what, what is the process by which poor countries uh, can become prosperous? Now, as I began to ask myself that question, um, I thought I needed to go back to school. I was fortunate to attend Harvard Business School and more fortunate to have been taught and mentored by uh, the late Professor Clayton Christensen. 
Uh, Clay Christensen was one of the most prominent professors at Harvard, and uh, before he passed away, he was arguably the most, uh, the world's leading mar management thinker. You know, he influenced leaders uh, such as uh, the late Steve Jobs of Apple and uh, Andy Grove of Intel. Um, he influenced uh, the strategy of uh, Reed Hastings at Netflix and Jack Dorsey at Twitter, um, and even Drew Houston at uh, Dropbox. Um, so to, to study under Clay Christensen is really an honor uh, of my life. You know, it turns out he was also troubled by the prevalence of poverty. And so we combined our efforts with uh, the help of uh, Karen Dillon, who used to be an editor at Harvard Business Review. And we wrote uh, a book uh, called The Prosperity Paradox, How, How Innovation Can Lift Nations Out of Poverty. Now, core to the message of the book is really how poor countries can become prosperous and less dependent on foreign aid. It is counterintuitive, but it turns out the simple idea is you don't fix poverty by trying to fix poverty. You know, instead, you fix poverty by focusing on creating prosperity. And what we learned is that the most viable path to creating prosperity is by investing in a particular type of innovation that we call market creating innovations. Now, market creating innovations are innovations that transform complicated and expensive products into products that are simple and affordable. As a result, many more people in society can get access to these products. Now this catalyzes significant development and creates immense prosperity. Now, for example, you know, in the early 1900s, when Henry Ford decided to build a, a car, uh, the Model T for the average American, uh, the U.S. was a desperately poor country. I mean, the demographics were similar to some of the world's poorest countries today. Life expectancy was around 47 years. Uh, few people graduated high school, let alone uh, college, or higher education. Over half the population lived in rural areas. Subsistence farming was not an anomaly. Um, and the average household spent more than half their income on food, similar to many poor countries today. But as a result of the new market that Henry Ford's Model T uh, built, America uh, began its, its path toward prosperity. Now, this new market led to the creation of hundreds of thousands of jobs. Uh, it led to a construction boom uh, that gave us suburbs, many restaurants, hotels, uh, and, and roads, uh, the plethora of road uh, infrastructure we have today. As a result, transportation become, became more efficient and it even increased school attendance by more than 40% in some regions. But you see, Ford was not alone in making products simple and affordable for many people. A culture of innovation and entrepreneurship swept across the United States and transformed this nation. Amadio Giannini of Bank of America. He made financial services available to poor and hardworking immigrants who could not get financial services from existing banks at the time. And now we have Bank of America. Madam C.J. Walker, she made health, hair care and beauty products available to disenfranchised and poor uh, black American women. Samuel Insull, he made electricity available to millions of Americans by figuring out a business model to make it affordable. And Charles Goodyear, uh, he lived in poverty for much of his life, um, but figured out a way to make industrial rubber a viable product. You see, the many things we enjoy in the U.S., the good laws, the infrastructure, the institutions, and, and, and a country that we can say does not tolerate corruption came after these innovators uh, developed products that were simple and affordable. Now, I know some of you are thinking uh, this is impossible to do, especially in Africa and other poor regions in the world. Um, times have changed, things have changed. Now, that's understandable. That is the reaction I also got as we began doing research. But unfortunately, that is not the case. It is possible and it is happening. Consider the example of uh, Mo Ibrahim, who built a telecommunications powerhouse in Africa. In the late 1990s, when the mobile phone was really still a new idea in many rich countries, Mo Ibrahim decided to take the innovation to poor countries in Africa. 
When he told his colleagues about his idea, they laughed at him. They said it was unthinkable. They're too poor, corrupt. There's no way this would work. There's no infrastructure, no education. But Mo Ibrahim focused on the struggle, focused on, in our language, what we call non-consumption. And he saw how people would benefit from getting access to easier communication. And so he built Celtel, a company that developed a business model that made mobile telecommunications simple and affordable so the average African could get access. As a result, in the span of seven years, he built a company that generated revenues of more than $600 million, net income of over $100 million, hired thousands of people and was valued at more than $3.4 billion in uh, 2005 when he sold it. Now that's not the most exciting thing. Uh, what's exciting is what market creating innovations catalyze. From 2000, what we saw was a boom in the mobile telecommunications sector. Today, that sector supports more than 100 companies, is worth close to 150 to $200 billion in Africa, generates billions of dollars in taxes and supports upwards of three to four million jobs. Three to four million jobs on the continent. That's just one industry. That's the power of market creating innovations. Oh, and unless I forget, Mo Ibrahim is now one of the richest people um, in the world or at the very least in Africa, he's, he's a billionaire. And this brings me to my third point. Um, how can you take part in the process? You know, there are many examples of market creating innovators on the continent today, but they need support from domestic and foreign investors. Um, investors who believe in the power of innovation to actually create prosperity. Investors who are willing to shift the paradigm from one that provides aid to one that focuses on investing in entrepreneurial capability to build prosperity. A company like Life Stores and M Farmer, uh, these companies are democratizing uh, access to affordable medication for many people in Africa. Flutterwave and Paystack are making financial services easier for the average person uh, on the continent. You Lesson is an ed tech company that is helping students learn without the physical infrastructure of a classroom, something that's becoming more important as we think about uh, the impact of COVID-19. There are also a growing number of funds investing in young entrepreneurs looking to solve the continent's problem through innovation. By investing in these funds, by finding out who they are, you are transforming the widespread poverty in Africa to shared prosperity for all. Now I'll end on this note. Um, you know, it doesn't get lost on me that uh, my core message is for you to lean in to the discomfort of investing in a region that is perceived as poor, as corrupt, as lacking in any kind of opportunity. Uh, many of you are already incredibly successful and you don't necessarily have to. But on some level, is is that not what Christ did for us? You know, did he not come to us when we were poor, when we were corrupt, and when we were lacking in anything good? And did he not breathe life into us? As faith-driven investors and entrepreneurs, we have a unique opportunity to transform the landscape of a continent by investing our resources in a way that truly creates prosperity. What would it look like if we lead the charge by finding these entrepreneurs, these investors, and supporting their efforts?